I need so guys, I thought I was going to be like the only person talking about product-led growth because it's something I've been talking about for like three years and every time I do it, I get somebody looking at me like, what is that? But I don't have to do the intro because I just watched the last two presentations and I was hearing about product qualified leads and I was hearing about product-led growth teams and it is awesome that this is catching on. But I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about product-led growth. Got a quick intro. I'm a partner at a venture capital firm. Uh, I spend a ton of time with early stage SaaS founders through to you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in our portfolio um, and get to just see what's going on in the market. And this is by far and away the most interesting trend that we're seeing evolve right now. It's gonna, it's gonna spend a few minutes on that. Um, I will call out, I have more of an enterprise sales background. I worked at NetSuite for about eight years before moving into venture capital. So I'm very much a convert to product-led growth. And I think I was resistant early on, but I'll tell you a little bit about it. Okay, so has anybody ever had this said to them? I was literally sitting in a boardroom where another board member said to a CEO, you should just be more like Slack. <laughs> well, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. They're worth like $16 billion. Um, I would like to do that. But I think the appropriate response to that is no shit how. Like, how do I do that? And Naomi gave you some really good tips. Um, but I think this is probably the hardest thing. And when you ask that question, you watch everybody kind of like clam up and go, oh my God, I'm not actually sure. And we have lots of SaaS talking heads and VCs and people who blog and speak at events. And everybody's telling you that you should be doing this, but not giving you the details of how it really happened. And we're still hearing people talk about inside sales and BDR teams and driving the marketing funnel. And while you can still build an awesome business doing that, we're seeing this evolution in go-to-market that is way more centered on the end user. So what I'm going to tell you is, I think it's all about embracing product-led growth. And that any business can do this. There is a spectrum here, right? It's not all or nothing, but there are tactics that you can take away that you can actually apply to any business. And it's really simple. You're orienting your product build towards an end user instead of the executive or buyer. And then you're actually distributing to those end users. And if you align those two strategies together, it works really well. That's what we're going to unpack today. So first, the end user era is here. And I'm going to tell you how I know this. We are going to talk about how your company adopted Slack. So how many people here use Slack? It's like everyone, right? I was resistant. I do too. OK. So you are mostly like VPs, founders, heads of departments. I can guarantee that no one sat down and was like, I'm going to write a 1,000 line RFP. We are going to look for a chat tool. We're going to evaluate 14, narrow it down to three, put it through a security process, bring it to legal, and like roll it out through a three-month deployment. What happened is Jane, and Jane's a millennial. <laughs> so am I. It's OK. Um, she was like, OK, I don't really like how many emails I'm getting, and I can't stay on top of this. So we need a different solution. And she probably texted three friends, and then she Googled it. And she maybe downloaded two. And Slack's process was really easy to onboard on. So she just started using it. And Slack's inherently viral. You don't download a chat product to talk to yourself. So suddenly, Jane's team's using it. And Jane's team really likes it. Right? They're realizing they're getting more done. They're communicating better. They're sharing better information. And it starts to proliferate. And it's like moving through your organization. And other teams start getting on. Everyone in the company starts using it. And you're walking down the hall, and you hear somebody say, like, let's go to lunch later. OK, I'll slack you. I need that file. OK, I'll slack you. And I'm like, when did it become a verb? But everybody loves it. And this thing is stuck. right? You're not ripping and replacing that at this point. And it's because all of these end users love it. The individuals are like obsessed that it has solved a real pain point for them. You can't rip this thing out. But it used to be really hard to adopt software. And I don't mean like 40 years ago. I mean like five years ago. And with many software products I still buy today, it took a lot of people. You had a really long sales process that included lots of people both on the vendor side and on the buyer side. You probably had an internal champion, you had stakeholders, you had an executive sponsor, you had the budget holder, you had someone in IT, and they were paired to somebody all on the vendor side. And if you got through that whole evaluation phase, you then had to figure out how to roll this thing out. And that can take three, six, nine months. I have like horror stories of ones that never went live, right? And then they just actually picked something else and started again. 
And then you gotta figure out how to get this whole group of end users compliant. Because by the way, they hate the thing you chose. You are making them fill this out. And all of that takes a whole lot of time, right? Three, six, nine month sales cycles, three, six, nine month implementation processes, and just hundreds and thousands of man hours spent trying to get an end user to fill out that one required field in Salesforce. I don't run a sales team. I don't see that every day, um, but not anymore. And I'm using Slack as an example today, but I guess what I want to point out before we dig really deep here is that it isn't just Slack. And if I look across the entire public market comp set, there are hundreds of public SaaS companies. There are 16 public companies right now that are employing a product-led strategy. That group of 16 product-led companies are growing faster. They're trading at higher multiples and they're worth 2x more. So like, that is my like, key takeaway of why we're focusing on this and why I, as an investor, am so excited about this model. Because if you can really figure it out and make it work, these companies are really valuable. Okay, so we can pick any of these examples. I'm using Slack throughout today because everybody knows it. But I bet you could say the same thing, that like Jane probably started using Zoom. She probably started using Trello. You didn't go out and evaluate those either. The key here is that for all of those products, the end users are finding them, and they're using them, and then they're coming to their boss and saying, you need to buy this for me. And then the boss is going, man, we gotta like lock this down, right? Um, I, I watched in my own firm how G Suite got in, right? And everybody's using personal Google Docs and Google Sheets, and I'm looking at this like, I have confidential information just like flying out the door. So like, of course, I have to standardize on that. And it no longer is really a choice. So your sales process really changes. That's the buyer evolution. So if I go back to like the 1980s, 1990s, software is literally in a physical box, in a physical rack, in a physical data room, in a physical data center. And that shit was expensive, right? People actually had to like set that up themselves. So the CIO was queen. Like her role was to make sure that whatever software you bought could actually work in your environment. And that was really hard. So they held the purse strings. And software sales, the go-to-market motion was aligned to that. Move forward. Think about like Salesforce, NetSuite, some of the early cloud companies and this proliferation of inside sales. What really happened there was that it got cheaper to produce software and to develop it it was actually hosted in the cloud and we started renting software instead of buying it. And so the buck passed. We cared less about how it fit into the environment and the executives within each department were now allowed to make a decision about what they wanted that was based on improving KPIs, the ROI, ROI they were gonna receive and not just what would most easily fit into the tech environment. And today, it's gotten even cheaper to make software Right, that infrastructure cost can scale with us. We're using APIs, we're using modular software. And that cost savings is being passed on to the company and the end user, which means a lot of what we're seeing is free or very low cost starts that allow people to try software. And that's what go-to-market has responded to. It isn't just that like, we woke up one day and we're like, it would be easier to sell with our product. Right? It's actually what's happened in the market. And so we've gone from a field sales motion that was really expensive, high cost distributed sales teams that carried briefcases, briefcases and ate steak to an inside sales model that was driven off of BDR teams, high velocity phone calls, marketing led, filling the top of the funnel. And today, our product is actually at the forefront. If we can get an individual user to find it to download it, to adopt it, and to spread it, that actually is gonna drive our conversion, our acquisition, our retention, and our expansion. So the end user is finally, end user era is finally here, right? We've actually evolved beyond that executive buyer. And this is what we're gonna do about it. So I'm gonna spend the rest of the session talking about kind of these two principles, which again, seem really simple that you can design a product for an end user, but it looks really different than designing for an executive buyer and then distributing to those individuals as well. 
Um, that mismatch is something we see all the time, where you could design just an awesome product that the end user loves and wants to use, but if you go try to sell that to the executive buyer, you have this clash. And so we'll unpack a couple of those examples too. All right, so first up, two tips for how to, uh, how to actually build a product for the end user. First is good design. So you wind back, let's talk like 2011, 2012, where like consumerization of IT was all the rage. Basically what would happen was all of our end users, ourselves included, got used to having really slick applications on their phones and in their personal lives. They got used to seeing really intuitive, thoughtful design where they didn't have to talk to a human and it just worked. And they were like, why doesn't this look the same for me at work? And that is literally like where product design came to the forefront. And for a while, that was actually enough. We saw a whole world of software companies that got created that were almost like feature parity with their competitors, just had a slicker design and were replacing the incumbents. That's no longer enough. And today, like, it's basically table stakes and you need to actually solve an end user pain point. So here's what's interesting. Solving an end user pain point, very different than an executive. An executive is basically saying, I need actual return on investment. I need you to improve this failing KPI. I need to have hard numbers that I can bring to my boss, to the board, to explain why I'm gonna go spend $300,000 on software this year. An end user is like, I'm pissed off at this little thing. I don't wanna do this anymore. I don't wanna do this thing on repeat, like 15 times a day, five days a week for the rest of my life. So here are two examples. One of the most common ones I think that everybody can relate to on the executive side is, I need better visibility into my sales pipeline. Spoiler alert, it is Salesforce. Um, <laughs> but think about how that gets adopted, right? No end user is like, ooh, I really wanna track every minute detail of my deal in a system. I'd like that to be read by like 15 other people. I'd like to get questions about it every day. And let's do a three hour forecast review weekly where we go through it. What actually happened is the CEO was like, I have no idea what number to call the board. And they need visibility. And so this is a top down problem. We wanna drive faster sales cycles. We wanna have better visibility into what deals are coming in. But ultimately, it's all about being able to manage a process. And that's what that executive is looking for. The end users aren't that complicated. They're like, I'm getting too many emails. Okay, but how do you go sell that? You can't go to an executive and say, your, your end users don't like sending emails. Like, that's crazy. But it's not just Slack. So think about, like, these are all really successful companies. Like, Dropbox, somebody literally said, I hate sharing files. And instead of the answer being, it's okay, SharePoint works, like, 30 employees started using it and then said, okay, we're doing this now. Um, web conferencing, I think that's a great example. Like, even, I don't know, like, seven years ago, I feel like I was still having, when I got on a sales call, the first 10 minutes was always like, did you download the WebEx thing? No, it's spinning. Have you tried restarting your computer? Okay, let's all hang up. We'll get back on. Like, Zoom just works, right? You can't argue with that. Um, but these are annoyances. These are not like, they're not really business critical. And so you need to figure out how to align the go-to-market strategy to be end user oriented so they can raise this pain versus you calling a VP and trying to explain how they're gonna see ROI from that. Okay, so second, we've agreed we're gonna build a product for the end user. Now we have to go sell it to them too, because they're your way in. If you go sell it to an executive, it's not gonna work. So there's four things we're gonna do. We're gonna distribute where they live. We're gonna make it super simple and frictionless to get started. We're gonna deliver value before they have to pay so that you're actually delivering on that promise of what brought them in the door. You're gonna solve this annoyance for them, not create another point of friction. And you're gonna hire sales last. And this one pains me, but you'll get it in a second. Okay. Every worker has like a couple of screens they use every day. It's the place they live. Let's just like assume Outlook or G Gmail or whatever you use for your like mail client is one of them. If I'm a sales rep, the second tab is gonna be Salesforce, right? If I work in e-commerce, my second tab is probably something like Shopify. If I am a like knowledge worker, I'm probably working in a Chrome or a Slack. If I am on the road, I'm more likely on a mobile device. 
If that's where I am, it's where you have to find me, right? It would be unrealistic to try to get me to go somewhere else. You have my attention in two or three tabs. Slack has done this like really, really well. They have the App Store. They're, oh, Google Play, that one's cut off, but you know what it is if you, if you don't have an Apple device. Uh, and then they have a, um, it, like a, is this one the Chrome one? No, yeah, Chrome Web Store. So you can plug it in wherever you are. The idea here though is you should have it proliferated so that each individual end user that you are targeting can find it for their own work style. And then once you do that, you have to make it extremely easy for them to sign up. So the left is basically what happens when humans are involved, and the right is what happens when you get them out of the way. If I showed up at a website, let's use the example of like Starbucks. I downloaded the Starbucks app. I did not have to request a demo. No one tried to teach me how to get my first cup of coffee, right? It was so simple. I didn't have to like accept anything. I didn't have to talk to anyone. Instead, I downloaded an app. I like clipped OK on some T's and C's, and I signed up. Slack has probably the best sign-up flow I've ever seen for this. All right, you go. I, I literally tried this. This is like three days ago. Go to Slack. I don't even have to click anything. I can just put my email in on the home page. So you've eliminated a click for me already. I'm like, yes, I want to get started. And then it says, would you like to create a new workspace? Yes, that is why I am here. So I get to confirm and click that button. It says, what's the name of your company or team? Traction is awesome. I literally accepted four pages of customer terms of service without ever clicking that link and in under five seconds. Right? Like, can you imagine if you got that far and somebody sent you an order form? Right? You're done. You have to remove all those friction points. And so as few things as you can ask for is really the key here. And I know that that's really hard, right? I think if we look at that sort of free sign-up flow as lead gen, the instinct is to gather as much information as possible. But if you can actually think about this the other way, which is gather as many names as possible and then look at the data and figure out how to market to them and convert them later, it's a much more interesting path for growth. So that comes to the next part, which is how do we actually deliver value to those end users? And it's all about the aha moment. People have heard that before, right? Aha moment. The idea is like, when do you as a user get excited that like this thing actually solves your problem? And you want to see it before you pay. Spotify is a great example of that. You guys, if you use Spotify, right, or if you use Pandora, or if you use Apple Music, you probably listened to some free music, you built a playlist, and you were like, oh yeah, like this thing works. I like this. It's why I came here. And then you're willing to pay the like, $6 a month not to have ads or to get your existing Hulu subscription for free. Um, and at that point, like, you're okay with swiping your credit card. But if in that sign-up process somebody had said right here, okay, enter your credit card, you're like, wait, I don't really know what I'm doing yet. So some common examples, aha moment, Zoom, it is like literally being able to start a meeting in two clicks. And the first time you do that, you're like, I'm a convert. Um, with Expensify, it is getting to the end of the month and realizing you can, you can submit your expense report with like four clicks because you took all the pictures along the way. With Calendly, it's that first scheduling setup where you don't have to do the dance of like who's going to send the invite. It just like magically appears on both calendars. The key is to figure out what your aha moment is and how you can drive all of your users to it. That becomes your North Star metric. It becomes what every team is thinking about. And then you can put a paywall in place. Now, I want to be really clear on this. While I'm focusing on like get users in and get them working on the product, you actually have to have a monetization strategy before you do that. You can adapt it. It can grow with you. But you can't like get all these users and then try to figure that out. It's really hard to do. So Slacks. There's a couple of interesting ones. Um, once they're, once they're in your organization, they are completely embedded in your workflows. There's two of the most common ones that I see. One is where you actually share these like documents back and forth, which is around storage. So that one is like, all right, I'm slacking with somebody, I'm in a group, and I'm like, do you have that file that was shared in the team meeting last week? And they're like, yeah, let me email it to you. You're like, you're not gonna go to another device if you're like in the middle of a conversation, right? You want it to be right there, and you hit this wall, 
And you're like, okay, yeah, like this makes sense. I should upgrade. The other one is archiving. Um, so I think it's the max is something like 10,000 messages, and then they just start deleting the old ones and you keep the new ones. Um, spoiler alert, I don't pay for Slack. We're still actually on the free plan, which is how I got these screenshots. Um, but the idea on that is like, I don't know, it's kind of bad because I'm talking about monetization. Um, all right, no one from Slack's here, right? Um, okay, but the idea on that one though with the, with the archiving is when you get to that point, you're literally like, oh, I don't want to lose that information. But like most people aren't actually searching their archives of chats. Like you, you don't need them. But like that is a moment where you feel like you do and you upgrade. Okay. So my last point for you guys is around when to hire sales. And I think this is a really hard one that you get pushed on by in particular board members and people that are not as familiar with this model and like are stuck in the inside sales or enterprise sales or mid-market mindset. And they just want you to go hire salespeople because salespeople mean revenue. And you gotta push back on that. So this is how to think of it. First, you wanna get logos. You wanna get users in the door. You wanna get people. It's really not logos, it's people. You get people in the door. And then you make sure that they have an absolutely awesome experience. You remove as much friction as you can. You start to create a community around the product and you hire support. That is the time at which you want people who are gonna respond to any issue at like any time of day and just make it easy and make it go away. And that makes those users bring their teams on because they're really excited about your product and they feel like indebted to your brand. You helped them. So those teams start using it and they have like slightly different requirements than users, right? They're thinking about different things. Excuse me, they may need some help actually figuring out how to bring other users on. They may have different requirements around security or around roles and permissioning. That's a great time to hire customer success. Right? You wanna help drive that expansion and drive that adoption throughout the organization. So now you've got support and you've got customer success. Maybe at that team level, somebody actually says, I want an invoice. And you're like, wait, we only do credit cards. We don't have to deal with that, do we? At some point you do, right? Like th that's when you start to have to have some humans involved. But the key is that those humans should continue to identify any friction points and productize as much as they can. You don't wanna fill product gaps with people, you wanna actually optimize them. And then at some point you get departments and like this is the best problem you could have. You have tens, hundreds, thousands of people, these bigger teams that are using your software. And you kinda of like trip that switch and an executive is looking at it going, wow, we're spending a lot of money on that. Like it probably hasn't gone through a security review and yet we're funneling all of our data into it. Um, maybe they want an MSA in place, right? In a bigger organization, they wanna have some control over future pricing. That is when you hire sales. You build the enterprise sales layer to handle the customers that you already have where you're starting to see that really natural expansion. And those salespeople work with the champions internally to drive that adoption and expansion. It's a really natural process. So this is my like ideal hiring plan and I was like, how am I gonna prove that with Slack? And then they did it for me. So I went to LinkedIn and I was like, how many employees does Slack have? This is again like a week ago. Um, sales is like 10% of their whole workforce and it grew 60% in the last year and that's a really big company. So I feel like I've proved my point. Okay, so in summary, everybody's gonna go home and be like Slack. Right now you know how. We're gonna do two things. Build product for end users, distribute our product to end users, and that's it. I need some traction. You need some traction. Let's get some traction. <laughs>